Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2019 Leading with Evidence webinar series. Starting with today's webinar, Promoting Equitable Outcomes with the Family First Prevention Services Act. I'm Suzanne Barnard, Director of Evidence-Based Practice at the Annie E. Casey Foundation, and I will be your moderator for today's presentation. The Leading with Evidence series uh, began four years ago when the Annie E. Casey Foundation and the William T. Grant Foundation collaborated to bring together researchers and program developers with child welfare leaders to discuss how to address the needs of children and families served by public child welfare systems. With the passage of Family First Prevention Services Act in 2018, we shifted our focus a little uh, mostly to address the new emphasis on prevention and implementation of evidence-informed practices. As many of you already know, the legislation is intended to create opportunities to build a continuum of preventive services that will support families in their communities. However, this legislation also comes with big challenges. First, there aren't enough programs that are both well supported by research evidence and address the needs of families who face significant barriers to permanency and well-being. Secondly, those that are available may not be equally effective for all populations, even when they are implemented as intended. We don't have any magic solutions today to these challenges, but we will highlight what some states are doing to include families and their communities. We'll talk about disaggregating data so that state systems will know who they are serving and how. And we'll talk about how that information can be used to bring families into the decision-making and implementation process from the start. Our speakers for this presentation are Megan Martin, Vice President for Public Policy at the Center for the Study of Social Policy, and Alexandra Citrin, who is a Senior Associate at the Center for the Study of Social Policy. Their presentation, Promoting Equitable Outcomes with the Family First Prevention Services Act, will help us become more familiar with some of the strategies that can be successfully implemented to support the advancement of equity and provide significant opportunity for public systems to, as they say, reimagine their work in service of children and families. But before we hear from Megan and Alex, I want to take a moment to go over some of the important housekeeping details for the webinar. After we hear from our presenters, we will have some time for questions. Because we have a lot of you again with us today, we will need to keep our attendees on mute throughout the webinar. We ask that you submit your questions by entering them in the Q&A window, which you see circled on the slide. You'll find that window at the lower right-hand corner of your webinar screen, and you can submit a question there to the panelists. If you are in full screen mode and want to ask a question, you may need to return to the event window by using the drop down controls at the top of your screen. I will also mention that this presentation is being recorded and the recording and slides will be available later at AECF.org. Alex and Megan have produced a document titled Seizing the Opportunity, 10 Ways to Advance Equity and Promote Well-Being Through the Family First Prevention Services Act. And today, we're very fortunate to have them here to talk about that document. Welcome, Alex and Megan. Thanks so much. Thank you for the introduction and thanks for having us today. This is, this is Megan. Alex and I are gonna sort of work off of each other so you'll hear us back and forth for the remainder of the call. Um, before we get started, just a little bit on CSSP. Uh, we're a national nonprofit and we're based in Washington, but we work across the country and we work at the local level, the state level, and at the national policy level, um, which really lends itself perfectly for the conversation we're gonna have about Family First today, because we worked a lot um, with the feds when they were thinking about what this bill should look like, um, and now we're working in states on implementation, which we think is really gonna be critical for this particular bill. Um, all of our work is centered on equity, and we've been doing child welfare policy work for over 30 years. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Alex for a minute. Okay, thanks, Megan. Hi, everybody, this is Alex. Just as we get started here, we wanted to start with just setting a basic foundation around family first so that we're all on the same page moving forward. And then as Suzanne said, we'll move into talking about how we can reimagine child welfare systems through implementation of this act. So the big key components of this bill are around supporting keeping children at their home, in their home communities when, whenever safe and possible, 
And when children do have to enter care, promoting appropriate placements for them. This means we're prioritizing family-based placements and creating safeguards against placing children unnecessarily in congregate care. The Act also provides new model foster home licensing standards to think about how we uh, ensure and promote keeping children with families and also extends Chafee service, services for youth in care. Just to talk a little bit briefly um, around prevention services, these services are uh, not available to all children and families, so there are some eligibility requirements here. Those eligibility requirements are that children are identified as candidates of foster care. And what's important to note here is that while placement, when children are placed in foster care, uh, those eligibility requirements are still linked to AFDC, so 1996 AFDC income requirements, children and families who are eligible for prevention services don't have to meet that income requirement. So there's no income requirement to receive these services. Children just have to be deemed candidates for foster care, and then them and their parents and caregivers are eligible to receive services. The other group of uh, children and youth that are eligible for prevention services are those pregnant and parenting youth who are in foster care. We say pregnant and parenting here because that's the language in the law, but we do want to note that many states now define pregnant to be expectant to include fathers as well. There also are specific services that, that are uh, reimbursable through this new 4E opportunity. Those include mental health, substance abuse, and in-home parent skill-based programs. All of the programs that receive reimbursement have to meet specific evidence criteria. Uh, these programs have to be either deemed to be well-supported, supported, or promising, and 50% of a state's spending has to be on well-supported programs. These definition are definitions and the criteria that meet those definitions are going to be included in uh, the Children's Bureau's Clearinghouse, which is forthco forthcoming. The Clearinghouse will also include a list of pre-approved services um, along with their rating criteria. One thing we want to note here is that the guidance for tribes operating their own Title IV-E system is a little bit different. These uh, tribes offer, operating their own systems don't have to meet, meet the same 50% well-supported requirement because of what we know about uh, evidence-based programs and their applicability to uh, tribal communities, tribal children, and families. The next major part of the bill is around ensuring appropriate placements. So here, there are now new requirements for um, how uh, the feds will reimburse states for maintenance payments uh, for children who do have to be removed and placed temporarily in uh, foster care. So through promoting appropriate placements now, uh, there's new funding available for uh, supporting kin, and there's also really an emphasis on recruiting and retention of foster parents and developing an array of, uh, array of placements for kids in care. There also are new requirements about assessments of need and judicial oversight so that children aren't unnecessarily placed in a congregate care setting when they can remain in their home community with appropriate services in place there. The law also now defines what we call qualified residential treatment programs. These are now the congregate care settings that states will be eligible to receive reimbursement for on behalf of children who need to be there. Again, there has to be an assessment of need that determines a child must be placed in that program and that their needs can't be met outside of uh, such a program. There are a number of requirements for these programs, including case planning, family engagement, continuing support for the child when they return back to their community, accreditation, and again, they have to be needs-based. It's important to note that pregnant and parenting youth, commercially sexually exploited children, and children who are placed in independent living programs are exempt from this requirement. They're excluded. So that means if a child or youth is deemed to be pregnant or parenting, they can be placed in a setting that meets, a congregate care setting that meets those specific needs with, and that setting does not have to meet the same requirements as a QRTP. Um, as we'll talk about a little bit moving forward, there are some uh, possible needs to really look at these exclusions um, and make sure that there are uh, policies and procedures in place to ensure that children of color are not disproportionately placed in these settings and are not given the same opportunities to reside uh, with a family-based setting. 
So now let's get to equity and reimagining this child welfare system. So it's really important to note here, and we really want to make sure that we make this point very clear, Family First does not advance equity on its own. This is something that states and communities must be intentional about in terms of reducing existing disproportionalities and disparities. We know that children of color are more likely to become involved with child welfare and more likely to be removed and placed in foster care. We know that African American children and families are less likely to receive family preservation services. And we know that Native children are disproportionately removed from their tribes and communities as well. This, this act really provides an opportunity for states to prevent hardwiring of new policy and processes that re reinforce existing inequities and also take steps to reducing existing uh, inequities. So again, it really creates an opportunity to undo existing systemic and institutional racism, but that opportunity has to be seized on by folks at the state and community level. Today we're going to talk about four specific strategies around what states and communities can do to advance equity through Family First. The first of which is engaging the broader community, then developing an array of prevention services, invest in growing the evidence, and reducing disparities in congregate care. So the first thing we're going to talk about then is around engaging the broader community. And when we say engaging the broad, broader community, we don't mean just checking a box. Right? Okay, we talk to our advisory committee. We talk to youth. We really mean thinking about how to do this in a meaningful, ongoing way that includes having really uh, transparent conversations and integrating that, uh, that information that's learned. So the first set here of strategies to engage the broader community are around including partner agencies and community stakeholders to gain multiple perspectives about the needs of children and families. Folks who are working in departments of behavioral health, departments of health, human services, they all have something to add here, as well as attorneys and other groups that are working with children and families. It's also really important to go beyond the usual suspects, so beyond those folks that you're generally engaging with, and look from the state level, look to child welfare staff at the county and local level. It's really important to look to these counties for what they're doing, the information they have, et cetera, um, because we know that not doing this could be an easy way, uh, I could be missing out on an easy way to gain additional information. Um, in a lot of counties, they may be trying something innovative and unique to that county that could really inform how a state moves forward with this prevention piece. And the same thing is true for data collection. I mean, there may be states that are doing, that where counties are doing a great job at collecting and disaggregating data, analyzing that data, and using it in a way that would be really beneficial at the state level when implementing this, um, but, but that aren't happening at the state level yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we know that folks are thinking, states are thinking about working with county and local folks in terms of implementation, but it's really important to have them at the table now. So the, other, the next group that we want to talk about in terms of engagement is around families. And here we, are, we really think it's important to be engaging families who have participated in prevention services as well as those who have not, right? There's a reason families don't participate in services and it's important to understand that. Is it because there's a gap in services? Is it because the services that are available really don't meet their needs? It's really important to try and get to the bottom of that in order to think about how a state then implements services that will meet the needs of children and families. It's really also important to meaningfully engage youth voice, so thinking about how um, you're talking to and working with those youth who are currently in care, who have recently aged out of care, particularly pregnant and parenting youth. It's also important to think about promoting a shared, how all of this work together promotes a shared investment in developing a plan that can increase accountability, and also thinking about mechanisms for transparency for how you're sharing this information. So we want to provide two examples here of states that are doing this. Uh, the, so Colorado and Ohio both have created publicly facing websites for transparency. They've created work groups and subcommittees to engage non-child welfare employees. If you Google Colorado or Ohio with Family First, you will come across the website that they have in place around this information. In DC, they're also conducting a number of focus groups um, with diverse folks, including direct service providers, as well as with parents who have received or who are receiving prevention services. Again, really thinking to this group to provide that information about what's working and what's not. 
The next strategy we want to talk about is developing a continuum of prevention services. Again, as we mentioned before, uh, children of color are, are more likely to come into child welfare and some families are less likely to receive family preservation services. We also know that LGBTQ youth um, come into care at a higher rate due to conflict with caregiver. So in thinking about the different pieces of the puzzle to developing a broad range of prevention services that can meet the unique needs of uh, families, it's really important to do all three of these things. Analyze your data and disaggregate it by race, sexual orientation, gender identity. Consider current approaches in your community that already have a strong fit and really meet the needs of children and families. In looking at these services, it's important to think about all services in the community, not just those that may already have an evidence base, but ones where you're building, the, building that evidence, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. It's also important to think about including targeted services, again, for pregnant and parenting youth and other groups to prevent re-entry um, into child welfare and, and that cycle of involvement with child welfare. I want to just make one other note around analyzing data, that looking at your data by your short stayers and newest entries can be a really good way to start to tease out what are the needs of communities and children and families that are coming into contact with your system at this point. So in Washington, D.C., as we're talking about developing an array of services, um, they recently submitted their first draft of the Title IV prevention plan that's required. And they, in developing that plan, looked at existing prevention programs throughout the city that were working. They then included some of those services in their proposed plan, even though they're not on the initial list of services that may be pre-approved by the Children's Bureau. So, for example, the majority of families in, in child welfare in the district are African American, and as such, they've included in their, program, in their plan um, effective black parenting as one of the prevention programs. In Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, they're really, we want to know, they're really primed to do this well, to look at their data and disaggregate their data um, in order to identify service needs and the needs of kids and families who are currently coming to the attention of child welfare and where there might be gaps in services. Um, as we talked about before, this can be a really uh, good example of where a county is doing really good work around data collection that the state can learn from and also use that information to help design their prevention plan. The next strategy we're gonna talk about here is investing in growing the evidence. And we wanna make sure that here we're um, highlighting a couple of things that we can do to uh, invest and grow this evidence, particularly around this population. So you'll see at the top of this slide that we've bolded some language. So only a small number of evidence-based programs have been normed on children and families disproportionately involved with child welfare and for whom the greatest disparities exist. For this, for this call, right, this isn't news to anyone, but it is really important because with the mandates that are a part of Family First, it may feel a little bit like a burden on top of a burden to have to really think about going above and beyond. Um, in terms of, of designating which programs you're going to use. But there is the ability to go beyond what's in the clearinghouse and make recommendations about what's working well in your communities for the populations that you're serving. And that's a really important step to take, to go beyond sort of the pre-approved list and make recommendations with, which the secretary can approve um, in order to make sure that there's as close a fit or as best a fit as we can, since we know there's a really limited amount of evidence out there for the for the kids and families that are largely being served in child welfare systems. Mm -hmm. It's also important to look to tribes that are operating 4E systems, both now and moving into the future, to see what they're doing and how they're building the evidence. Um, and also some of the National Quality Improvement Centers. So, uh, you know, there have been a number of National Quality Improvement Centers and waivers that have been in place and are build, helping to build that evidence. We also want to talk a little bit more about the ways that states can utilize maintenance of effort dollars. Um, so within the law, there is a requirement that the new Title IV funding must support and not supplant existing investments in prevention. This is really important because it creates this pot of money within each state. There's a specific formula for each state that can be used flexibly. These dollars do have to stay in prevention, but other than that, there are no real um, strict requirements. So it creates a unique opportunity 
for states to invest in innovation um, because of these, there are no eligibility or evidence requirements for these dollars. Um, so some of that could be investing in, in uh, evidence building for an existing program or just providing an ongoing service that you know works for kids and families in your community. The final strategy we're going to talk about today is around reducing disparities in congregate care. And we know that disparities exist in congregate care, right? We know that kids of color are much more likely to be in uh, congregate care. We know that LGBTQ youth are much more likely to be in congregate care. So there's a real opportunity here to focus on reducing these disparities. We also know that as states move to reduce the number of kids in congregate care, it's going to be much easier to move younger children out of congregate care settings as opposed to some of these older children. So a real opportunity here for states to be intentional. So the first strategy we really want to talk about is around implementing foster parent recruitment and retention strategies for youth who are overrepresented. And it's equally as important to focus on targeted recruitment as well as targeted retention here, right? So for foster parents who come to the attention of the agency and are working well with these youth, it's really important to think about how to best support them. Um, and this could be through providing in-home support for foster parents like mobile stabilization services, um, targeted training to increase foster parent capacity and skills, really important opportunity here. We also know that research has highlighted that girls of color are more likely to be identified and to be at risk of commercial CSEC. So they're really, it's really important here to also be building in uh, policies and procedures to reduce unintended consequences of placement with youth in more restrictive settings. Um, these placements in more restrictive settings can and will have lifelong outcomes for these youth, uh, consequences, excuse me, for these youth, um, which we want to make sure that we're trying to prevent in every case possible, right? So thinking about how do we ensure appro appropriate assessments of all youth in care that promotes their safety but also prevents bias from influencing placement decisions. When we think about LGBTQ youth as well, you know, adolescence is a complicated time in development where risk-taking and identity development is critical and part of that. But we know that when young people have been bullied or rejected based on their identity, uh, they can act out. It can result in behaviors um, of acting out. Really, these youth, in some cases, may actually just need to be in a, more, in a setting that is going to affirm their identity and support their identity and who they are, rather than a more restrictive setting. So really making sure that there are policies and procedures in place to help states and systems walk that balance and line and prevent children of color, LGBTQ youth, et cetera, from being disproportionately placed in congregate care. So one example that we have of this is in Prince George's County, Maryland, um, they are working to implement, design and implement a training that all foster parents are required to take regarding serving kids with diverse sexual orientation and gender identities, so kids who identify as LGBTQ+. Um, we know this is also true for the state of California, and there, there are other places where there's this um, requirement, but it seems like it's, it's not always rolled out in, in, in as fully as maybe we would want to see it. And, and I think for this, it's really important, right? Because we know that this one is attaching to, to families when they've already come into the system. It doesn't address recruitment. But without targeted recruitment and not, without really universal training, um, it's going to be hard to meet some of the mandates that are in Family First around reducing congregate care. And it's definitely going to be hard to serve LGBTQ kids, kids of color, um, as well as we need to, to do. So we want to make sure we leave plenty of time here for uh, questions and answers. So we're just going to wrap up here with a couple of key takeaways and resources. So I mean, we've said this throughout the conversation, and, it, and it's definitely true that implementation is, is key here. Um, so in order to, to actively ensure equity and prevent unintended consequences, it's not going to happen on its own through implementing this bill or through any real change you might make in your child welfare policy or practice. It has to be sort of the center of your focus and a, a part of all of the conversations that you're having in order for it to have a meaningful impact on kids and families of color 
kids and families who identify as LGBTQ+, um, and other families that we know are disproportionately served by child welfare and who face disparities when they're there. Mm -hmm. The second is that equity isn't just an add-on. It has to be core to the implementation strategy. When we're thinking about the prevention services, for example, if we're not taking an equity approach here and thinking about and using our data, disaggregating our da data by race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender identity, et cetera, we're going to miss those children and families who are not currently being served well, and we're going to miss the opportunity to serve those families. As states look to reduce the number of kids who are entering care um, and who can and increase the number who are able to safely remain in their homes and communities, they have to look at who's disproportionately entering care, right? Who's currently not being served? So equity's really got to be core to building out that array of continuance continuum of services from the beginning. The third point here is around intentionally focusing on equity and that that should help states better meet the mandates of Family First. So as we were just talking about as it relates to congregate care and reducing the number of kids who are in congregate care settings who could otherwise stay in their home uh, communities with the appropriate supports and services, it's really important here to think about recruitment and re retention strategies that can support youth who are disproportionately in these settings um, so that you can move forward with that really good strategy. We want to highlight a couple of resources here. As Suzanne mentioned at the beginning, uh, the first resource at the top is 10 Ways to Advance Equity and Well-Being through FSPSA. A lot of the information that we've touched on today is available um, in that document. The next one, uh, responsibly defining candidacy within the context of FFPSA, this is a new resource that we've just released and really touches on how states define candidacy um, and use that for eligibility. Um, there are obviously some equity implications there, um, and we'd be happy to chat with folks about that as well, um, later on as well. The next two pieces are around pregnant and parenting youth FAQs, um, and then opportunities for better serving families at the intersection of domestic violence and child welfare. There are also some additional resources from CSSP that we want to highlight that really help lay the groundwork and the framing more broadly for uh, the importance of focusing on equity through child welfare reform and reimagining your system. The first one is a report out of the shadows around supporting LGBTQ youth that really talks quite a bit about existing disproportionality and disparities and provides recommendations on strategies to better support these youth in care. The next one, Achieving Racial Equity, similarly talks about child welfare strategies, um, but focused really on improving outcomes for children of color. Expanding the Evidence is a unique piece that talks about the relationship between evidence and equity um, and opportunities there. Again, we're happy to answer any questions now about anything that we've talked about or any outstanding questions. We're also uh, happy to answer questions offline later on, so you'll see that our contact information is included um, on a couple of slides here. So with that, I'll hand it back over to Suzanne. Thanks. Thanks, Alex and Megan, for such a great presentation. It's really good to hear about what the states are doing and um, to know a little bit more about how implementation can be strengthened. And also thank you for providing access to the CSSP resources. Um, we have lots of questions. So um, Kate and I are madly um, writing down the, the questions as they come in. Um, the first one might be uh, answerable by your resource out of the shadows. but. Uh, supporting, uh, supporting LGBTQ youth. Let me ask you the question, though, and see if um, there might be some supplemental information. Question is, are there specific programs um, for, that serve LGBT youth uh, in care that have evidence to support them? That's a great question, and I think it goes back to when we talk about evidence, how we're defining evidence and level of evidence, right? There are a number of programs that have maybe some qualitative evidence. There's been a, a study done, an evaluation done. Um, so in that sense, and also it's important to look at programs currently that are being evaluated 
through the National Quality Improvement Center focused on LGBTQ youth and child welfare. So there is some of that building of the evidence now. Um, the first set of programs that have been included in the Children's Bureau's initial list that they're going to look at uh, does not include many of these programs. Um, but again, this is why it's really important to look at the criteria that's in the Children's Bureau and think about the match between an existing program that supports LGBTQ youth and the evidence that it has and where it may match with some of the criteria outlined and propose it yourself in your state plan. It also might be that the, if there's a program where it's not, doesn't quite yet meet the promising level of evidence, that's an opportunity to use state dollars or MOE dollars, or maybe you partner with a foundation or a local university uh, to help build the evidence so that you can share that and later move it on to your uh, Title IV prevention plan. Great, thank you. Um, another question, how can states start to think about um, supporting basic needs services like housing, job skills development uh, in support of their impl implementation of prevention services? That's a really good question and one that we hear a lot. Um, and I wish that we could easily give you an answer that says that these dollars can be used for that, um, that $40 can be used for that. Un unfortunately, they cannot under the law. However, there are still a number of opportunities here to think about how you're supporting those concrete and more basic needs. Um, the first one is to think about some of the programs currently so uh, that are providing sort of wraparound services to, uh, to a family. So many programs that provide parenting skills also provide some of these job skills, employment, or housing supports, right? So, now through the prevent through the 4E dollars and through Family First, now some of that, those dollars, um, you may be able to get reimbursement for part of that program, right? For the part of the program that's providing the, uh, the parenting skills class. So at least you're now being able to fund part of that through federal dollars. That may free up some additional state dollars that you could look to invest in the broader community um, you could also think about, given this expansion of where you can use Title IV-E dollars, how your state is currently using, I know it's a very small pot of money, so I'll uh, preface it with that, but CBCAP dollar, community-based child abuse prevention grant dollars that can be spent, that have um, less requirements around evidence and can be spent on more of these concrete needs. Um, so those are a couple of places. Looking at your state and local dollars that are going to be freed up, looking at CBCAP, for example, as one other federal program, um, and then thinking about how you can fund programs in part, at least from uh, the federal dollars. Great, thank you. Um, what, um, what funds are available that you know of to provide evaluation for culturally responsive programming? Um, do you know if there's oh. specific set aside for that? That's a great question. So there are requirements um, that any prevention program included in a state's uh, prevention plan that they, that they are evaluated um, and that the state has continuous quality improvement processes in place um, with the caveat that states can ask that the secretary waive the evaluation component for well-supported programs. Um, but there is not a separate pot of money sitting somewhere to evaluate uh, new programs or build the evidence of existing programs to increase their evidence rating. Um, so I, I think that's a really good opportunity for states to be thinking about partners in their own community within universities, local foundations, um, looking at other folks who are invested in this and thinking about how you partner to build the evidence around um, these, these new programs. Great. Um, Here's one. Oh, sorry, I would say I'll just add that if somebody is doing something interesting in your state around that, we would love to hear about it. So please reach out and let us know. Yeah, that's a good point with any of these questions. If, if we're missing some great work being done at the state or county level, um, please let us know or Megan and Alex so we can, we can start to talk about it um, in the venues that we have uh, to us. 
um, is the uh, uh, what are the implications of not having evidence-based programs normed um, for families of color? Could you clarify that a little bit? Um, we we've mentioned um, that there. There are a lot mm -hmm. of programs not norm for them specifically, and um, the uh, audience member needs some clarification for that. Yeah, so I will do the best that I can to answer that question, although I'm sure there's some on the phone who uh, do evaluation day in and day out who would have some more technical, uh, a more technical response to this. But sort of the layperson understanding of this and uh, what we can use is that for these programs that haven't been normed to this, to this population, to a tribal community or to a community of color, um, you can't say that that evidence exists for the same outcomes, right? So you can implement a program that has been normed for community A and implementing that as is with fidelity in community B may not lead to the same outcomes that you saw in community A. Uh, I, I can also add from the Casey perspective that we know that programs that were normed, uh, you know, a long time ago and have been in effect for a while, we don't we don't know because of institutional racism and other other uh, challenges that whether or not families were actually that needed the services were actually referred to those services or did they benefit from those services or were those services adapted um, to meet other needs. We also mm -hmm. know that um, some cultures are not able to take advantage of use universally available programs because they're not in their language or they're not um, being delivered in ways that are understood more easily understood by that particular population. So there are a lot of things that affect um, yeah. the delivery of yeah. services to specific populations. Absolutely. Yeah, and um, here's a, a question that we've had a couple of times. Um, when will we know, and I don't know if you guys know this, but when will we know what EBPs will be uh, the final part of Family First? So when will the entire list, yeah. is there a deadline yeah. for the entire list to be generated for um, reimbursable EBPs? That, that's a great question, and I wish I could give a more definitive answer, but what the Children's Bureau has said is that they are going to be releasing in April, we're in April, um, so hopefully very soon, the criteria for each of the evidence categories, so the criteria for well-supported, supported, and promising. Shortly thereafter, they should be releasing um, the ratings for the first set of programs that they identified that they were going to review. So that first set of programs included uh, functional family therapy, uh, parent-child interaction therapy, TFCBT, multi-systemic therapy, motivational interviewing, parents as teachers, nurse family partnership, Healthy Families America, uh, families facing the future, and methadone maintenance therapy. Um, so they, they should be releasing the ratings for those. Uh, in the next month or two, uh, they said May, um, and then over the summer into the early fall, they're going to be releasing a list of the next set of programs that they're going to be evaluating. Um, it's important to note that this clearinghouse that includes these services will not be, it'll be continuously updated, so there will be new programs being added to the clearinghouse. Uh, programs will be moved up the list um, as more evidence is gained, so something that may start off as promising may be in the future can be moved up to be supported and well supported based on some of these ongoing evaluations. So um, we're expecting very soon to see sort of the start of this clearinghouse and what it looks like, but um, that's, that's the plan at this point and it'll continue to build. So again, a, a real opportunity here for states and communities to look at what's working currently um, that you all want to provide and propose um, to be included in your prevention plan. Thanks. Um, I also wanted to just weigh in briefly about the evaluation funds question. We, we've gotten some response from the listening audience, and I just want to hold out that we, Casey strongly supports research practice partnerships as a way of building evidence and as a way of collaboratively seeking funding um, for programs. We did a whole webinar on it um, in 2018, which I'll um, 
show you, WT Grant Foundation, our partner in this series, also provides um, funding for those kinds of partnerships and has a whole resource list of um, tips and suggestions for ways to, to um, establish those partnerships. We did a webinar last fall, I think it was. Um, I'll show you the link to it in just a minute, but it's all about the importance of and giving some examples of research practice partnerships. So I think, um, especially with the requirement for evaluation um, and, mm -hmm. and most child welfare agencies being unprepared to meet that requirement or even understand what's required in terms of data collection, um, I think is, is going to be a, another subject we're going to have to tackle with some, um, some regularity in this series. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we've heard from universities and from child welfare systems reaching out to universities that there's some interest there um, within that partnership as well to do some of this research practice evaluation. So um, the opportunities are there, it's, but it is um, in lots of cases sort of a newer, I'll say, um, way of working in child welfare. Um, so. Um. Okay, moving on to a different topic. Um, well, same topic, but different question. Um, what uh, can you uh, redefine a little more the the prevention services categories? So, um, promising, supported, and well supported are um, sometimes the definition changes a bit. So, just in the guidance from the first release of the um, FFPSA to to this, the the new guidance released. The definition of well-supported changed a little bit in that it doesn't require um, a, a, a journal article anymore, or uh, but it does require maybe a manual or, or mention in, a, in some kind of document. So um, as those requirements change a bit or as they are modified a bit, um, how does that impact the definition then of prevention services? That's a great question. Um, so that, as, as the person noted in their question, that changed a little bit, and I think um, we were very supportive of that, right? Um, thinking about flexible, uh, being a little more flexible here. So the clearinghouse that comes out will have the final criteria and definitions for what well-supported, supported, and promising will be. Um, so without having seen those final definitions, um, I'm not sure that it's appropriate or that we know any more um, comment-wise, but we're expecting that those definitions will be what's coming out very soon that will help help shape and help determine where people advocate for certain programs. Um, so for example, you know, if in your community you're implementing uh, effective black parenting, um, and based on the criteria provided in the clearinghouse, you may think that it's supported, right? It may meet the supported there. So it's really important to think about what evidence exists and match that up with the definitions that are coming. Um, but those are what's expected to be released in April, May. Uh, yeah, I, I heard that. Uh, I heard that too. Um, can you? Um, this is a related question. Um, and, and there's another one that I'm going to just sort of combine because it's the same topic. But the, the general uh, two questions combined are about saying a little more about the exact steps um, to it, it might take to propose the use of non-pre-approved approaches. So those, mm -hmm. um, how would they, how would states go about proposing funding and supporting for those homegrown programs that yeah. don't have the kind of evidence that we're talking about, but could be um, moved along in that direction? Yeah, uh, so on November 30th of 2018, the Children's Bureau released a program instruction um, with clarifying a lot of information around the prevention services and other components of the bill. That um, program instruction also included uh, a preprint draft of the Title IV-E prevention plan. So it, you can find it online. Um, and looking at that, it will include sort of the table that uh, states have to use to submit um, their prevention plan, right? Here's the program we're submitting and here's why. Um, when a state is writing the why, if you will, um, I would really encourage them to look at what evidence has been uh, generated and exists for that program and very closely match it to the definitions that are going to be provided in the um, 
in the in the guide. Um, obviously, as I mentioned, or in the clearinghouse, excuse me. As I mentioned, DC has already moved forward and put forward a draft plan without having seen those. Um, so one strategy could also be to look at other clearinghouses and see how they've rated them. Um, you know, the California Clearinghouse, obviously, as folks on the phone, I'm sure know, is a good place to start. Um, and I think that there are some programs there that are rated promising that actually my, I am anticipating could be rated higher on the Children's Bureau Clearinghouse based on what we've seen so far. Um, here's a related question. Is the clearinghouse just focused on prevention services or will it eventually include services for kids in, in foster care? So already system involved youth. Uh, so it won't include, uh, it's focused on prevention, but the other thing that it will include are kinship navigator uh, services. We didn't really talk about that as much today, um, but there are kinship navigator programs um, that they're also working to build the evidence of. Um, I believe there are two that are currently on the short list that are being evaluated and we should get ratings for those. Um, those will be also included in the clearinghouse. Um, and as we're, just as a note around the Kinship Navigator program, um, the states don't have to meet the same 50% well supported for uh, Kinship Navigator program. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. I, I think we're coming to the end of the questions. I, um, and we're also going to get close to ending our time here. So I, um, I appreciate both Megan and Alex. Um, your, your presentation and your participation in these rapid fire questions. Um, do you have anything else you want to add before we move to, to closing here? I think we want to just say thank you for every, for having us here and uh, having us share this information. Um, you know, I think our key takeaways really hold that there's a real opportunity, as you mentioned, to reimagine how child welfare systems serve children and families and being proactive in that implementation is key. We are resources here. Please, please, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions, want to talk more in depth about the work in your state, um, or need anything else from us. We're, we're here and, and happy to help. And thank you again for having us. Well, thanks for, for being here for us. Um, and thank you, everyone else, for joining our webinar today and participating in this great discussion. Um, on this slide, you're going to see links to our previous webinars in the Leading with Evidence series. Um, and I, um, I want to call attention to the um, Tools and Resources for Research Practice Partnerships because we are getting a couple more questions about university partnerships already in existence, but um, experiencing difficulty with um, fitting into child welfare budgets. So there are um, some suggestions in, in that webinar for um, collaborative funding um, seeking, and there, there's also a pretty robust resource center um, link that I, I think you'll get um, if you click on this link, you'll be directed to the WT grant resources um, with some further suggestions. So I don't, I don't want to leave that topic uh, off the table because I, I believe our, our university partnerships are critical and, and will be even more key um, moving forward. Um, with the, uh, implementing this legislation. So, um, I'd like to close by inviting you to our next webinar in July called Six Fiscal Analysis Steps for Family First. We've been working on this topic after uh, requests from our audience following last year's webinar on funding programs and child welfare systems. Um, we've learned uh, more about funding critical interventions as we've looked at implementing Family First, and we will try to pick up where we left off last year um, with some more tips and suggestions on the use of fund mapping tools for, for public systems. Um, in addition, please remember you will get a recording of, of each webinar, including the one you ju we've just presented, uh, so you should have the information you need all in one place. So thank you once again for joining us today, and, and have a great afternoon.